and thank you for joining us for Environmentally Speaking, brought to you by the Richmond Wayne County Environmental Awareness Council. I'm your host, Stephanie hayes Masoni. In the past few years, you've probably heard the terms such as global warming and climate change. Maybe you've heard a lot about it or maybe just a little bit and would like to learn more, especially in the past few months with the release of An Inconvenient Truth, a documentary on Al Gore's journey throughout the world giving presentations about climate change and what's going on to cause climate change and how we can reduce climate change. Al, as part of an outreach initiative, Al Gore has vowed to train 1,000 people to go out and deliver these presentations as well. Here with us today is Dr. John Van from Ball State University. Dr. Van is a marketing professor in the Miller Business College. He's also the coordinator of the green initiatives of Ball State campus and also a big part of the greening of the campus for Ball State University. He's here today to tell us a little bit about climate change, about his training with Al Gore, and as well as how we can maybe reduce our effects on global climate change. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Van. I appreciate you being well, here. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank you for asking. Well, tell us a little bit, first of all, how you got <coughs> involved with this big initiative of Al Gore's to start to spread the word um, behind the PowerPoint presentation that's documented in An Inconvenient Truth. Well, I think it happened because I've been a part of the green programs at Ball State for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. So uh, when they asked for people from Ball State who might be interested in attending the training program, uh, my name was put forward as one of the possibilities and I quickly responded and I got to go. So it was a real opportunity so you for me. You put your name in that hat really quickly, right? I did. <laughs> it's a great opportunity. And it was happening so quickly. Um, I think they came up with a program, it was almost at, like at the last minute. Mm -hmm. And my name, I had actually been, my name had been submitted by the end of that day. Oh, wow. By the uh, World Wildlife Fund, uh, excuse me, National Wildlife Federation, mm -hmm. the campus ecology program that they have. And they were the ones that asked Ball State who might want to go, and oh, uh, so they submitted my name. Well, what an exciting adventure. It was a wonderful opportunity. And I, I really consider global warming to be the, the premier threat to humanity mm -hmm. right now. It's, it's the one most important topic that we need to deal with. So it was a great chance to go and see what's being done in terms of spreading information about it. and gain more background and also they, they gave us a packet of, of slides, <laughs> a, kind of a mega PowerPoint presentation with 330 slides in it. That's a lot of slides. So it's up to us as presenters to kind of customize it and make it our own mm -hmm. and I've added some slides that I've created to it as well but used the core that they, mm -hmm. they gave us plus the background training. That's great. So as part of the training, I, I'm assuming you had several different sessions on how to deliver a speech and those kind of, those kind of technicalities, but what were some of the, the meat issues that they, they briefed you on as part of the presentation? Well, let me tell you a little bit about the visit down yes, there. Yes, please. Because I was really lucky to be in the inaugural group that um, we were the 50 from across the country, the first 50 to go through the training program. And they were learning how to train people by training us. So we really got treated very well. Uh, since there were only 50 of us and there have been 200 in the follow-up groups, they oh, could wow. spend more time with us mm -hmm. and they could devote more resources to us. So the, uh, the very first morning, we got on the buses and rode out to Al Gore's farm in Carthage, Tennessee. And we, they had the tobacco barn set up mm -hmm. there where they did their auctions and they had folding chairs there and they had a black sheet across the door and they had, they had a screen for Al Gore to give his presentation to us. But wow. before we did that we had coffee and donuts and then we got on these uh, hay wagons and there were bales of straw or something there and, and we rode down to the spot on the river that you see in the, the mm -hmm. movie An Inconvenient Truth when he talks about returning home and getting grounded by being back mm -hmm. to nature and so forth. So this whole crowd of 50 people plus the entourage were riding on these wagons being pulled by pickup trucks down there. And I was so lucky I got to sit on a bale of straw right next to Al Gore. So oh, wow. we were talking as we went down there about what his plans were for the farm. And uh, we got down there and we had a, we all got off the hay wagons and assembled by the river and he talked for a while and some of the others in the group talked and uh, got back on the wagons, went back up to the barn and then he gave his presentation. Oh, so okay. that was the first part of the, the actual core of the scientific information. Mm -hmm. So we went all the way through his PowerPoint presentation. 
Now, did he do all 333 slides that time? I think he must have wow. because it took a long time. <laughs> I bet. They had more planned for the day, but they hadn't done this with a group mm -hmm. before, so it it went much longer. Plus, we had questions, oh, so yeah. it stretched it out. And they had something planned for that afternoon that they had to cut out. So when he finished, we uh, got back on the buses, went back to the hotel, and then that night they had reserved um, a restaurant in town where the country and western, or not western, the country songwriters oh. debut their music. Oh, for, wow. They come and play it for the public. And they reserved that as a private party, and we went in and ate supper there. They had a barbecue buffet, and these singers sang to us, and it was, that was really a, a great experience. The next day, then, we, uh, we just stayed in the hotel, and we had uh, more on the PowerPoints. We went into more depth on the mm -hmm. science behind them. And <clears throat> There was someone there, they had a science advisor from the University of Michigan, a climatologist mm -hmm. who was there to help. But they also had someone who had written a book on how to give good PowerPoint presentations. Oh, wow. So he talked about content and format on the slides mm -hmm. themselves, how to deliver, how to do an opening, how to do a closing, and we practiced doing openings and closings at our tables, and uh, that, that was also very good. Now, this r was really a speeded up process because I think when it occurred to Gore to train a thousand people, I don't think there was a program to train a thousand people. In place yet. <laughs> yeah. So he said, we'll train a thousand people, and I think his staff then had to scramble and put all this together. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit rough still when we were uh, going through the training. Some of the slides wouldn't work on uh, PC-based mm -hmm. systems because they'd all been developed on Mac systems. and. Uh, I don't know what that system's called other than PowerPoint. It's another system, mm -hmm. but they, they didn't all transfer, and I got into a loop on one where it would play an animated show, and then you click on it again, and it would play it again rather oh, than going to the next, passing, yes. next yeah. slide. So uh, I think since then they've tried to work a lot of those things out, mm -hmm. and uh, they've come up with new packages that they're giving to the more recent trainees. Anytime you're doing something for the first time, especially packed into two days, oh, yeah. there's a lot of bugs to work out. Oh, well, the same <laughs> no with me giving the presentations. Yes, exactly. I have to revise mm -hmm. and come up with new answers when I am uh, confronted with questions that I can't really handle. And to me, that's part of the learning process is being someone who goes out and gives presentations or programs. Somebody's going to ask you a question you don't know, and, and instead of working your way and sort of trying to answer it, it's important to say, I, I just don't know, and I need mm -hmm. that's, that's, I think, an important part of the learning yeah. process for everyone. Cause we can't I've all learned an incredible amount going mm -hmm. through and preparing the slides and doing the background research on, on climate change. Being a marketing professor, I've had to do a lot of self-educating. Mm -hmm. I was a physics major in college, but that was many years ago, and <laughs> uh, we didn't get into these issues. Then. No, yeah, not at that time. What, with, I, I assume, I know there was a lot of technical, um, of how, how to deliver presentation, and then they, they did have the climate scientists that were involved with, with helping you kind of sort through some of the facts and things mm -hmm. of that nature. And one of the things that I always come across with when I'm talking to certain groups and people is you have the folks that are um, skeptics or say, well, what if, I mean, global, we know that global climate change or global warming is, it's a natural curve. It happens, it comes, it goes, it comes, it goes. It's going to happen mm -hmm. and come and go, and we're just part of that cycle. Yes, that's true, but what is your answer to a question of that nature? Well, one thing that really helped uh, was the fact that Gore himself has given this slide presentation over a thousand times. So he's had a lot of those hard questions, He's I'm had sure. a lot of mm -hmm. the hard questions, and he's put in slides that will confront and answer some of those uh, questions and he also helped to explain them to us. Mm -hmm. Now I found that uh, when I gave the presentation earlier uh, to another group I was confronted with a question and I didn't have the data at hand to, to answer it. So for the presentation that I gave today here in Richmond I put that slide mm -hmm. in and it turned out that that slide was in that base package of 330 slides. I just hadn't put it in the shortened version. Yeah, and when you're dealing with an hour or 25 minutes or half an hour, you can't do 333 no. slides. There's no in way. In fact, uh, the f I have right around 45 slides okay. now, and it's all I can do to get that done in, it, in 25 or 30 minutes. Oh, right, because yeah. it, it's a hard thing to get anything across, and especially once you start talking, if there's questions and things That's like that. Right. It's, it's a hard dynamic to deal with. What what were one of the some of the highlights of the training? I know there was several different uh, groups of people that they try and represent when they have people come be trained and mm -hmm. I know you said that there was 
for instance, the Miss New Jersey was one of the folks trained. Right. What was the different gathering of folks that, that were in your training? Well, we had some folks that had, I guess, more notable positions like that. Uh, the, the mayor of Annapolis was mm -hmm. in our group. Uh, the secretary of state of the state of Oregon was in our group. Uh, the city manager of Bangor, Maine was in our group. But we had, um, we had a, a retired person who had seen the movie, got so excited about it that he also bought the book. There's a companion mm -hmm. book that goes with it. He scanned the book, made his own PowerPoints, and had already been making wow. presentations before this, the Climate Project ever came. There's a not-for-profit organization called the Climate Project, mm -hmm. which is doing the training for Al Gore. And he was giving this presentation before it was even possible That's to get impressive. in the program. He was giving it primarily to uh, DR, DAR groups. Oh, huh. And he's put together a, a package that he's now made available to all the chapters across the country. So when he put in his application, you can imagine how excited they were to have somebody who'd already been out there mm -hmm. in the public doing this. And um, so he was retired. There was a woman who, I got the impression she was a, a self-made multimillionaire who is, wants to move on beyond her business now. And she actually paid her own way there. Wow. Um, I didn't have to pay for my training. I did have to take care of the hotel and uh, transportation, but uh, I got support for that. But she not only paid for her training, but for two or three other people's training. That's impressive. And she wants to go out and, and do this too, of course. And there were students there, college students. There uh, was a, a retired politician from the East Coast. And, so There's a wide really variety. A very wide variety. And I think, uh, you, as you mentioned earlier today, that means that these people all have their own natural constituencies. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be able to reach different target markets in, in spreading the information about global warming. Yeah, absolutely. That's very exciting. So what is something, since obviously we don't have time to go through all 300 in slides or any mm -hmm. of, uh, too many of the slides, what are some of the, the bare bones kind of facts and figures that folks need to be aware of? To me, when I watch the movie and when I've seen your presentations, there's some certain things that you just see and they're just staggering as far as the glaciers melting and, and what mm -hmm. that's going to do at our coastlines and, and the extreme weather events and things like that. Mm -hmm. What are some of the, the very important kind of facts that we need to know um, to start to be able to, to be informed about this and make a difference? Well, I, some of the things I couldn't talk about today mm -hmm. are things like uh, we're going to see more droughts and more flooding. Uh, since the atmosphere is warming, it can hold more moisture. So when it does rain, it's going to rain a lot. We're going to have more winter rains rather than summer mm -hmm. rains. So there will be more droughts in the summertime because it's going to be hot with a lot of evaporation. I think, although I didn't have a slide on that in the presentation today, that information is really critical. As you mentioned, the melting glaciers are going to cause a rise in sea level. I mean, it's already programmed in. It's just a question of how large a rise of sea level. So I think that's important. But you, you can imagine that part of the problem is that so many people live along the coast. It's like 50% of the global population is along the coast. There are some countries like Bangladesh where a huge portion of their country is just a few feet above sea level. So when it rises there, they're going to displace like 60 right. million people. And where will those people go? <laughs> yeah, it's, so it's going to be a huge number of environmental mm -hmm. refugees. Uh, so I think that the rise in water levels is important. I think another thing that I think really needs to be put across to the public is the notion of positive feedback loops. Mm -hmm. And I, I think initially those are a little hard to understand, but what it means is that one change leads to another change that reinforces the first change. So you end up with a, a spiraling increase. So, for example, in the Arctic with the melting ice and the loss of reflection from the ice back into space, the water will absorb more heat, which will melt more ice, which will, which will lead heat. to more absorption, mm -hmm. which will melt more ice. So those positive feedback loops reinforce the whole process of uh, what the impacts are on Earth for, mm -hmm. from global warming. So I think that's a second major thing. Uh, a third major thing is looking at the cycles, as you alluded to. There are cycles that occur over time. Uh, there are about four major cycles. There's one that occurs on a 100,000-year basis, one on a 42,000-year basis, one on a 22,000-year basis, and one that occurs every year. 
And if you trace these out, and we can do this because of the record in the, the ice cores that they take from Greenland and Antarctica, and they're, they're like annular lines in the ice, so you can look at the ice and take the bubbles in the ice and analyze them for carbon dioxide content and also for the ratio of oxygen, six to oxy oxygen 16 to oxygen 18, which indicates the temperature. Mm -hmm. So for the history in the ice, you, can, you know what the carbon dioxide level was every year, and you also know what the temperature was every that, year. That's an impressive amount of information in that we have Going back 650,000 years. So the yeah. evidence is very hard there, yeah. which brings me to my next question is, we hear, oh, there, it's a controversial subject. It's, you know, there's some, it, is it or isn't it happening? And one of the slides and one of the things you t talk about in the, in the presentation is that it's not really a controversial subject among right. scientists. Right. It's um, out of over 900 articles written about climate science over the past 10 years, uh, there were none that said there was any uncertainty about whether or not global warming mm -hmm. was occurring and whether it was caused by greenhouse gases that are emitted by human activity. So scientists are unanimous in their conclusion that it's happening now. The popular press tends to think that they need to show a second side, mm -hmm. but apparently if you look at the science, there is no second side to this. So they can find people that will say, yes, it's uncertain, but if you look at the scientific literature, it's just not there. It's not there. So let's break it down to just bare basics. What is it for, for some folks who are kind of learning? And to me, for me, some of these things take a while to get into my brain. What is it that is causing global warming? What, I mean, what is the chemical and what are the okay. greenhouse gases? Let me go back to one thing I mm -hmm. was talking about earlier, and then I'll, I'll come back to this. If we look at that record in the ice of the cycles that occur, mm -hmm. one of the things that really jumps out at you is that uh, in, the, in that record, th the level of carbon dioxide in those bubbles was never higher than about 285 parts per million. Oh, right. And if you look at where it is right now, now it's at 385 parts per million. So it's way above that ice record going back 650,000 years, mm -hmm. much higher than, and the temperature is higher than it was as indicated by the ratio of O16 to O18. So, that's another thing that I, I think is really important. We, lo we look at what's causing uh, global warming. There are four primary greenhouse gases. Carbon dioxide, water vapor, which was a surprise to me. Mm -hmm. It's a very potent greenhouse gas as a vapor. Methane, which is 20 times more potent than carbon dioxide, but there's not nearly as much of it, and it falls back out of the atmosphere more rapidly mm -hmm. than carbon dioxide. And the fourth is nitrous oxide. So. Those are the most important, and except for water vapor, the other three used to be tied up in underneath the Earth's crust, either in coal, mm -hmm. oil, natural gas, or limestone. And what's happening now through human activity, we're taking the limestone and we're turning it into cement. That releases carbon dioxide that was sequestered in the limestone, right. that was taken out of the water by those marine organisms and uh, put into the body of the the organism and stored as limestone for millennia. Uh, the carbon that's in the coal is being taken back into the atmosphere where it was removed at one time by all the plants growing in the Carboniferous mm -hmm. era. The, uh, the natural gas, the methane, was derived from decomposition of plant material in the absence of oxygen. Uh, the oil was the phytoplankton that had oily bodies and they fell to the bottom of the ocean and took the carbon with them. So all that carbon used to be tied up underneath the Earth's crust. And now we're digging it out as fast and as we can. And we're <laughs> digging it out as fast as we can and releasing it into mm -hmm. the atmosphere. So that's really where it's coming mm -hmm. from. It's coming from human activity through the combustion of fossil fuels and making of cement primarily. And then the water vapor. The water vapor we can't do much about, but the bad news is that I mentioned about the positive feedback loops. As we, the air gets warmer, it holds more water vapor, which creates more warming so it can hold more water vapor in and so on. Right. So that's basically it. Mm -hmm. if, if we can stop using fossil fuels, stop making cement from limestone, mm -hmm. then we can start a downward spiral. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately that's not on the horizon in the very new, near future to, for folks to, to do that. Cause well, there are some people who are trying. There are. There yeah. absolutely are. Yeah. And they're, they're trying to make cement out of other things too, like fly ash. Mm -hmm. In, instead of using so much limestone. And it's apparently a very good 
concrete that can be made from that. And it's getting rid of a waste from another process instead of landfilling right. it or doing something else. And it. we are moving in some areas more toward wind energy mm -hmm. and solar energy. Wind and solar energy are just growing at incredible rates. Those mm -hmm. industries are, if you look at the growth rate on their curves, they're just exponential. It is, it's impressive. And some countries like Denmark get about 30% of their electricity from wind energy. Uh, we're moving with higher technologies to finding possibly we'll be able to spray surfaces with nanoparticles and have just a sheet of glass acting as a solar mm -hmm. photovoltaic cell. So we're using more solar energy, more wind energy. I understand they're looking at sites here in Richmond mm -hmm. as well. Um, and we're trying to replace fossil fuels. It's just a very slow process. When you get locked in, if you build a new coal-fired power plant, you've got that for the next 60 or 70 right. years. So you're committing future generations to the carbon dioxide generated by burning coal, which generates more carbon dioxide than any other mm -hmm. fuel that we can burn. So some people are doing things and some aren't, and we just need to get more people on the bandwagon. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Earth and you look at what's happening in terms of taking things out of the Earth's crust and releasing them into the atmosphere, we just need to close that process up and not and not do it, mm -hmm. which means a lot of substitutes, alternative energy sources, renewables. So that's where we need to go. The exciting thing to me, I guess, and being a new mother and working with children as a big part of my occupation, and we're just looking out for the future in, in general, is that the tools are there. We have these mm -hmm. tools. We have this knowledge to, to start to make a difference and to make a difference on a very big on a very big scale. Um, and it's can be very gloom and doom, and it can be very um, overwhelming but we can't give up because, right. um, as you were saying earlier, you know, we'd be kind of stupid to, to give up. It's kind of one of those things, you know, if you don't ask the question, you don't get an answer. And mm -hmm. so if we don't try, we're not going to make a difference. And it's encouraging to me, I think, to see that we can make a difference by changing light bulbs. And I, there's mm -hmm. a fact that you stated earlier about change, if you changed five of your light bulbs to the incandescents. Yeah. Across the United States, mm -hmm. if every household changed five incandescent bulbs out for compact fluorescence, we'd need 20 fewer power plants. And that's a huge difference right oh, yeah. there. And that's and an easy thing everybody can do. All that carbon do. dioxide that would have been emitted by mm -hmm. those power plants. So everybody can do that. Not only is that good for the environment, but it's good for the pocketbook. Exactly. Because if you change out compact flu fluorescent bulbs for incandescence, mm -hmm. the other way around, yeah. get rid of the incandescence. <laughs> Put in the compact fluorescence. You'll save $30 to $50 per bulb over the life of the bulb. They last 10 times as long and use a third of the electricity. So and it's just an incredible. Too. That's right. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible investment, actually, yeah. with a high return. It's, it's impressive. Yeah. And it, it's important for everyone to know that doing things like that and turning off your lights when you're not using them and not Setting idling your Setting your thermostat car. lower, not idling. Yeah. What are some things, tell us some things quickly before we finish up, that we can do just as an average homeowner to make a difference? Because every little bit makes a difference. Yeah, well, actually, if you start, uh, let's say you just kind of walked into your house and you saw there was a washing machine and dryer there, you could say, are they Energy Star or mm -hmm. not? You go in and you flip on the light, is it a compact fluorescent? Mm -hmm. um, you have an entertainment center, is it consuming phantom electricity or are you turning it off at a plug strip? Mm -hmm. Or have you got an Energy Star uh, equipment? Because they have less of that phantom energy. Phantom energy is kind of a weird thing. It's uh, where your TV set is on when it's off. Right. You turn it off, but it's still on in the background waiting so for So that it'll it. turn on instantaneously when you're ready for it to be on. Or right? when you hit the remote. Mm -hmm. it's, it needs to have electricity to sense the remote. So you can just kind of walk through your house. Do you have a programmable thermostat? Mm -hmm. What do you have the heat set at in your house? How hot is your water heater set? Do you have uh, low flow aerators on your faucet so you lose, use less hot water to wash your hands? Do you wash your clothes in cold water? Do you have your hot water, seat at, hot water heater set at 120 rather than 140? Um, do you turn your heat down at night when you're sleeping? What kind of car did you arrive in? Is it hybrid electric? Does it get very high miles per gallon? Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you drive your car? Do you do jackrabbit starts? Do you ease up when you're at the light? Or do you just sit and wait? <laughs> Are you an aggressive driver yeah. or not aggressive Do you driver? use your cruise control on the highway? Because if you slow down and then speed up, you've got to recover that speed again, and that uses additional energy. Sure. So actually, everything you touch has a carbon dioxide component. Absolutely. So and there are just many, many things that we can do. It's impressive. Well, it's great to know that there are things that we can do because this is a global issue. 
this is an international issue, it's a national issue, it's a state issue, it's a community issue, and it's an individual issue that we all owe it to ourselves and to our future generations to do something about. So please remember to change out an incandescent light bulb each time you go to the grocery store or go to a home improvement store. Buy a, buy a compact fluorescent light bulb and replace one at a time, one at a time, or go through and change all of them. Not all of us can maybe put up a hybrid wind system and, and solar power system, but everybody can change a light bulb. Everybody can drive a little more, less aggressive, and mm -hmm. be better for their health as well. We all have things we can do. To find out more about what you can do to make a difference, please visit the following websites. You can go to copeenvironmentalcenter.org. You can also go to stopglobalwarming.org. You can go to climateproject.org, I believe, and climatecrisis.org as well to find out more about what you can do to make a difference, or just go Google it. Go Google energy efficiency or anything that you might be looking for to, to improve in your household. And next time you buy a new appliance, make sure it's Energy Star certified. Thanks a lot for joining us for Environmentally Speaking. Thank you to Dr. Van for, for being with us today and telling us Thank a little bit more about much. global warming and what we can do to make a difference. And have a great day.